Okay, very warm welcome everybody um, to the next lecture of our series Stockholm Plus 50, Five Decades of Global Environmental Governance. I'm Lena Parch, I'm Professor of Comparative Politics here at the Otto Suhr Institute. And I organized this public lecture series together with a range of students because we would like to take stock of by now five decades of global environmental governance. Our common theme is Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. The first lectures dealt with the environmental SDGs. So we heard about climate, biodiversity, ocean, and freshwater politics. And today we focus on an SDG that includes only an environmental sub-target, SDG 5, SDG 5 on gender equality. So with sub-target 5A, governments agreed to undertake reforms to give women equal access to ownership and control over natural resources, uh, resources among other things. However, ecofeminism is about a lot more. And um, it's a great honor to welcome Sherilyn McGregor and Ursula Meck from the University of Manchester today. Um, before the two of you start your talk, um, one or two of the students are going to introduce you, uh, Jana and Michael. And then the talk lasts for about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. Good afternoon. It's my great honor to present to you Professor Dr. Sherilyn McGregor. She's a professor of environmental politics at the University of Manchester. Her research focuses on the relationship between environmental sustainability and social justice, applying insights from intersectional eco-feminist and other critical political theories. Publications include the Edited Handbook of Gender and Environment, and the monograph Beyond Mothering Earth, Ecological Citizenship and the Politics of Care, as well as many other articles on feminist perspectives on climate change and sustainability. Professor McGregor is also editor of the Environmental Politics Journal. We are delighted to have you with us today. Um, yeah, I'm happy to welcome Ursula Marki. Um, who is the co-author of the manuscript on SDG 5, and Ursula is here to answer your questions after Sherilyn's lecture. Ursula Marki is a second-year PhD candidate um, in the Department of Politics in the in University of Manchester, and their thesis is focused on the concept of housewifeization. Located at the boundary between political economy and ecology, their work brings literatures on social reproduction, queer theory, and critical political economy into conversation with critical ecofeminist theory and environmental politics. Currently, um, their research interests include heteronormativity, biopower, and environmental governmental governmentality, particularly in relation to the global politics of uh, COVID-19. And we are especially looking forward to this lecture because um, Professor Sherilyn McGregor and Ursula Marki take a critical ecofeminist look not only onto, on SDG 5, but also um, the entire sustainability agenda. And without further ado, I would uh, like to give the floor to our guests. Um, and we are very much looking forward to this lecture. Well, thank you, and thank you for coming on such a very hot, sunny afternoon, which, and I'm sure you much prefer to be at the lake, I've heard, is where people go at on, time, on a day like this. Um, but yes, thank you very much for coming, and thanks for the invitation and for that very nice introduction. Um, yes, this is a, a co-authored chapter that Ursula and I have worked on together. Um, and it draws on research that we've been doing um, over the years. We work together. Ursula is working on PhD. I'm supervising the PhD. Um, and it really sort of is, a, is an opportunity to collaborate um, on thinking about issues that we both work on independently. Um, and this is research that tries to look at the risks and the possibilities associated with linking environmental goals with the pursuit of gender equality through a focus on women as an inclusive term. And this 
sort of critique, this sort of analysis, is not unique to us, uh, but is part of a long-standing project of academics and activists who work at the intersection of environmentalism and feminism. And I hope that um, by the end of this lecture, you will have a, a, an introduction at least, uh, maybe a clear idea of how this work and why this intersection is significant to global environmental politics. I thought I would start by explaining the title of the talk. Um, and <laughs> sorry for the literal imagery here. Um, but I wanted to make sure, make you know that we're not talking about water pollution or actual uh, polluted streams. It's a metaphor um, for thinking about um, a paradox where feminists have lobbied for greater attention to their concerns about gender injustice and inequalities via mainstream channels like in the United Nations, while at the same time they are critical that these mainstream channels are themselves highly problematic and in need of change. So this is a notion of mainstreaming that so many feminists want to, to engage in, but also at the same time are critical of. We start the chapter, and this, this talk is going to follow quite closely the content and the structure of the chapter. Um, but we start the chapter with this quotation um, which we think is a really good illustration or a way of an, uh, sort of capturing the main argument that we make uh, in the chapter. And this is a quote that was um, from uh, a statement delivered by women's rights organizations at the just before the development of the SDGs. So in uh, 2013, in the sort of work that, that uh, policymakers and UN officials we're doing to try and think about the, what would come after the Millennium Development Goals, thinking about sustainable development agenda going forward. And of course, there were um, a number of feminist organizations kind of underneath the umbrella of the women's, uh, ma women's major group um, who made this statement at the end of the process. And I'll just read it. So we caution against developing another set of reductive goals, targets, and indicators that ignore the transformational changes required to address the failure of the current development model rooted in unsustainable production and consumption patterns, exacerbating gender, race, and class inequities. We do not want to be mainstreamed into a polluted stream. We call for deep and structural changes to existing global systems of power, decision-making, and resource sharing. This includes enacting policies that recognize and redistribute the unequal and unfair burdens of women and girls in sustaining societal well-being and economies intensified in times of economic and ecological crises. So that was almost a decade ago. The statement, you'll get a sense, was very powerful, very critical. Nearly a decade later, we now have a Sustainable Development Goal, Sustainable Development Goal 5, specifically calling for gender equality. Are we happy? Are we, do we stop there? Has the job been done? Not really. Questions remain. Have feminists succeeded in swimming against the current to achieve this deep policy change that they wanted, or have only token drops of gender equality been poured into that same polluted stream? And that's the question that we look at in the lecture in the uh, chapter and indeed this lecture. So what are we, what we will do in this structure of the lecture is um, start off with uh, an introduction to our critical eco-feminist perspective. Then we'll talk about what are the, what is SDG 5, give you an introduction to the content of SDG 5. What are the eco-feminist criticisms of SDG 5 and beyond, so the, the agenda 2030 uh, in more general terms, and finally, what are some ecofeminist responses and visions? So asking for transformational change, what does that look like? I, I plan at, um, at two points in the next 45 minutes to take a, uh, take a pause so that I can catch my breath, but also to give you a chance to speak to the person next to you about some of the things that I'm presenting. So, so maybe just have a chat, talk to each other, or if you're sitting on your own with no one near you, just reflect to yourself. And that, that will potentially generate some 
reflections and questions you might want to ask at the end. Okay, so what is a critical eco-feminist uh, perspective? Um, the, before I get into reading these, these main points, just to give you a bit of a history of um, eco-feminism, um, it's been around for maybe 30 or 40 years. Um, it's an easy way to explain it is that it's sort of integration of two of the most important new social movements of the 20th century, environmentalism and feminism. Um, it came out of activism, particularly um, ac feminist activism, f feminist activists within the environmental movement feeling that gender concerns and concerns about um, on, you know, sexual division of labor, gender division of labor, uh, gender inequality was not being taken seriously enough uh, by uh, people in the, in the green movement. Started as an activist movement and then eventually found its way into academia and research and, and, and various forms of political theory. Um, it's internally diverse. We do not claim to present a sort of one voice for what is an e a critical eco-feminist perspective. It's very internally homogenous, internally diverse. There's lots of debate within the field. So this is really our perspective and the one that we've developed through our own uh, discussions and, um, and, and, no and knowledge of the uh, particular types of theoretical literature that we read. So I can't give you a much more than that as an introduction. Um, for, of course, in the, in the chapter, there's some recommended readings. So if people wanted to go and read more deeply or to find a, a, a general introduction to the field, there's some recommended um, places to start anyway. So that being said, there are some common traits um, that are worth um, mentioning. Um, an eco-feminist perspective is broadly concerned with the interconnections between the exploitation of the living environment and the oppression of humans under the interconnected systems of capitalism, colonialism, and heteropatriarchy. Um, Ecofeminism draws on more than three decades of scholarship on the gender environment nexus that challenges hierarchical binaries in Western philosophical thought, which legitimate those oppressive and, de and destructive systems. And these binaries include we, um, binaries that you will all sort of dualistic thinking, dualistic structures that you will probably be well aware of, reason, emotion, culture, nature, individual, collective, man, woman, male, female, masculinity, femininity. So these binaries that sort of structure uh, Western philosophical thought. Um, so there's a critique of these binaries as well as, as thinking about how they've shaped and sustain not only big social structures, but also how they shape the micropolitics of everyday life. And the core aim of ecofeminist thinking is to find strategies for, trans for troubling and transforming these and transcending these, these binaries. Critical ecofeminism, I mean, certainly um, it's important to say that we, we, we put the word critical in front of ecofeminism. We really want to make it clear that this is a uh, a stance that um, incorporates the tools of critical social theory um, into the ecofeminist project. And this means it draws on counter hegemonic and heterodox theoretical traditions, including Marxism, uh, post structuralism, decolonial thinking, um, to pursue a project of political and economic transformation. And by critical, we mean specifically that we're not interested in problem solving per se, if that problem solving entails taking the world as it is. So that's to paraphrase the kind of distinction between critical and problem solving by Robert Cox, which is a sort of famous um, IR theorist who made that distinction between critical and problem solving. Um, of course, we want to address major problems. Ecofeminists are interested in the major problems of the world, of the global environment, but perhaps just as crucially, it adopts a questioning stance that foregrounds the violence of existing power relations in order to disrupt them, right? insisting that um, an intersectional understanding of the world is necessary, an intersectional as opposed to single axis understanding of the world. And finally, it makes a normative commitment to human nature relations that are just and fair. So let's unpack briefly some of these concepts um, I think here, like making, thinking about intersectionality, some of you will have heard of it before, some of you may not have. 
Um, it's a key word in, the, in our field. Um, it's important to sort of think of the, the distinction between seeing the world through a single, uh, sort of understanding that single axis is one that sees the world th through one social category only. So for example, Marxism could be considered to be a single axis uh, approach because it puts class as the kind of primary axis through, through which it understands the world. Um, to some types of feminism, notably white liberal feminism has been labeled single axis because it takes a kind of very simplistic understanding of gender as a single category. Environmentalism to the extent that it just talks about humanity as a, as a category, a big global we, so to speak, that we're all in this together as a, as a species, that in a sense is a bit is a fairly single axis. So contemporary um, ecofeminist scholars use an intersectional lens to understand diverse identities and experiences of people of all genders as well as to avoid, and this is also really important, to avoid essentialism. So the, this is the idea that biological sex determines um, gender uh, identity or sexuality. So in the chapter, we have a box that explains um, what is an intersectionality, and it gives you a bit of a background. Um, and if people are interested in hearing more about that, I can, I can answer that, or we can answer that during the uh, Q&A. But importantly, so we, we critical ecofeminist perspective, but a, it's a critical ecofeminist perspective that is informed very much by political economy. Um, and it draws on the tools of ecofeminist political economy, which is a subfield within with, within ecofeminism that examines the role of gender inequality in economic development and theorizes a material link between how nature, women, and all things feminine have been historically externalized and exploited in capitalist economic systems. So it's critical of the logical structure of Western industrial modernity and Eurocentric values of the Enlightenment. And this perspective regards the climate crisis as stemming from the same root causes that drive the plethora of gendered, racialized class inequalities in the world today. Um, so it's definitely very um, critical of neoclassical economics, uh, critical of neoliberal uh, ideology, neoliberal managerial governance, and sees both of these as unfit for addressing the current crisis. To the extent that it um, re reproduces classical economic models and neoliberal ideology, the day-to-day -day functioning of sustainable development, ecofeminists would argue, depends on the devaluation of caring labor or what often is called social reproduction. Um, and this caring labor or social reproduction is performed primarily in family and families and communities. Um, and yet because it is um, a free subsidy to capitalism, it is invisibilized and externalized uh, by hegemonic economic paradigms. Um, and so uh, it's important to sort of think about how uh, e ecofeminism wants to then try to revalue and try to center that work in its approach. Um, so, so we've, we've drawn on a, a number of different theorists um, within ecofeminist political economy, and we were talking about this in, our, in preparation for coming today, and noticed that an over, maybe more than a dozen of our key sources in the chapter come from German ecofeminist authors. So I wanted to just, this is a bonus, a bonus slide. This is not in the chapter, but we thought it would be, you would be interested, if, and maybe you already know this, some of you will be well aware of this and some of you don't know that there are so many really important, certainly important to us and our work, uh, academics who have who've contributed to the development of, uh, of ecofeminist political economy in particular. And we've na I've put a few names up, uh, up on the screen uh, for you to have a, have, a, have a look at. But also within activism, um, going back to the founding of the German Green Party in the late 1970s, um, there have been some very important uh, feminists who have shaped green politics uh, and are now shaping the global climate justice agenda uh, in different forms, different generations of, of, of feminist activists. So I think this is um, worth, uh, worth knowing. Um, so to move now to thinking about how feminists have engaged politically with sustainable development. I started at the beginning by reading a quote which comes from 
uh, sort of the, a network of feminist uh, lobby groups that have been part of the, the process. Um, it goes back even further than the drafting of the SDGs. It goes back to um, the start of the whole UN sustainable development process since 1992, since the Rio Earth Summit. Um, and the women's major group, which is a kind of um, network of um, feminist civil society organizations from all over the world um, that kind of promote um, women's human rights, political empowerment, and gender equality, they have always played an active role in trying to develop um, so the concept of sustainable development and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and play still to this day a very uh, active role in monitoring progress towards, towards the goals. Um, so this is a, this is a 30 some odd, some 30 year history really of engagement. Um, some, some have said that we, we might be going backward, that in fact in, in the, the 30 years ago, the Agenda 21, which was the outcome document of, of the Rio uh, Earth Summit, had women's empowerment at its center and foregrounded the role of women in pursuing environmental and development goals in a, in a much more sort of progressive way, or perhaps, or was much more centered in that work. And that we've sort of, over the years, it has been either kind of diluted or weakened for, for various reasons. But still, the arguments are, are continue, to, continue to be made. And there's a number of different strategies, or rhetorical strategies, political strategies, that feminists at these, in these processes make. And one of the main arguments is that, you know, thinking that, you know, that, that, um, that gender equality is relevant to sustainable development because women are disproportionately affected by ecological destruction and climate change. Uh, and there's lots of evidence that has been um, co collected over decades um, supporting this claim that particularly that because of their social roles, um, often in unpaid domestic and care work, um, that they're, they're more reliant on land for their livelihoods and incomes, and therefore they're much more vulnerable than men are to the t deterioration and destruction of natural resources and environmental quality. So there is a lot of this, this argument that women are more affected, and so um, they, they have to be uh, really recognized in this um, project of sustainable development. At the same time, they also there's an argument that because women are so affected and live so you know often you know so close to the land through their um, their unpaid sort of uh, environmental care work through temps through gathering firewood gathering water tending to domestic crops and so forth that they have a kind of you know a, a bigger stake in in uh, environmental protection and therefore have a kind of knowledge and uh, motivation that needs to be sort of harnessed and captured for the sustainable development agenda so that they need to be empowered to be more part of the process than they have been uh, previously. So that's always part of the lobbying. Um, but it's important to note that, that those are sort of, um, th those, are, those are strategies that are used in, a, in the UN lobbying context and that, that, that they're debated, they're hotly debated. And these, these women's major group and, and say for if in, in the climate change example, uh, the women's and gender constituency of the UN FCCC, they, um, there's, there's such internal diversity of these groups. There are women, women's groups from all over the world. So there's, there's no one voice, uh, ultimately. There's lots of internal debates. It's important to note that there's internal debate. And one of, the th one of the internal debates, as I alluded to earlier, is between mainstreaming and transformation. So thinking about how do we, some will, will put their efforts into just getting gender in the document, right? Just getting gender to be, or gender equality to be added to the documents that are being developed and produced through, through, through the process. And others will say that's never gonna be enough and when, when gender is mentioned, it, it, it hides a lot, of, a lot of political issues that need to be, uh, need, should be addressed. So with these insights in mind, this sort of background and insights into the critical perspective, into the political process, um, we next want to kind of think about SDG 5 and, and talk about the specifics. So, um, what is SDG 5? Um, now, as I said, the SDG 5 has been met with mixed reviews um, by feminist activists and academics. 
there are some who see it as a, an important positive step uh, that have, has come. It's been hard won, hard, hard fought for and hard won by feminist uh, lobby groups. So there's something to say that um, on the whole, having, an, uh, having a standalone SDG 5 for gender equality is a vast improvement, particularly a vast improvement over the Millennium Development Goals, which were very weak um, on women's rights and gender inequality. So, so really you might say to have a standalone goal with nine specific targets is a, is a success, right? It's a success and, it, and it's something to, to celebrate. So let's take a look at now. Obviously you're not gonna be able to read all of these. We have it, a box in the chapter with, with, with all of these in it. Um, so you can see there's, there's nine different targets and each one of these um, nine different targets has um, uh, some indicators which uh, are used to, to measure progress towards them. Um, and what we thought we would do is have a, this is a bit of the interactive bit. Before we sort of move on to the critique, right? So applying the critical feminist lens, critical feminist perspective to SDG 5 and its, and its um, targets, we thought we would just give you sort of two minutes to just think talk to the person next to you or sort of like think, what might their, what might feminist or critical eco-feminist perspective highlight, be worried about, be concerned about, want to question in that list? If indeed you can read it. Can you read it well enough? Okay, so I would just pause and take a drink of water and you have a think for a couple of minutes. Okay, we can. Uh, I can put the slide back up later if you if you'd like to engage with it. But let's let's move on. So, I'm sure many of you've noticed some really positive um, targets in this list. Um, targets 5.5 and 5.6, for example, um, continue in the same vein as previous development discourse, which regards which with which thinks about the importance of education, participation, opportunities for leadership and decision making. So, really trying to think about empowerment. Um, clearly also wants to end 
violence and other harm, harmful practice against all women and girls. I mean, these are very important types of targets. So, you know, don't want to think that we, we're only critical, but we feel it as our, because our, our interest in, is in critical theory and, 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 criti and critical thinking, uh, there are several noteworthy points of contention um, and that we want to draw and we draw in the chapter. So in the chapter, we look at two specific problems um, that are visible when looking at SDG 5 through an eco-feminist lens. Uh, and you probably you won't be surprised to know that both of these have to do with, with, with binaries because of course um, eco-feminists don't like binaries. So first problem is adopting a binary approach to gender. Um, so we, we note and many other eco-feminists have noted that SDG 5 holds, upholds um, and uh, employs a simplistic view of gender as being synonymous with women. So why is this problematic and why shouldn't we focus on women, right? right? It's true that women are denied the same rights and opportunities that men enjoy in most countries around the world. As a group, they are underrepresented both as citizens and leaders within political, corporate, academic, and cultural sectors. They earn less, they own less, they carry out more hours of unpaid subsistence and care work than men. And feminists have long argued that if these disparities are to be addressed successfully, the complex processes that create and ma maintain them need to be understood holistically and relationally. But here we see that rather than take a kind of relational and holistic and more political approach to gender, SDG 5, fo SDG 5 focuses on the empirical category of women and girls without thinking about this complex nexus of power relations. Uh, between women and girls, between men and boys, between women and men, which produce all different forms of social inequality. Uh, it conflates gender and sex and maintains a strict binary view of gender that ignores people who don't identify uh, as either. So gender non-conforming is not part of the discussion. Um, Moreover, the goal does not sufficiently address relations between women and men and others, but instead treats women and girls as isolated objects of violence and disempowerment and doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about them as already subjects with variable forms of agency and subjectivity. In addition, the focus on women in this way obscures the gender-specific harms and structural constraints that result from the cultural overvaluation of men and masculinity. There's no mention in the SDG 5 on gender equality on men and boys, either as, uh, as um, people on the, on the receiving end of social injustice or as people who are privileged in, pri in privileged positions to either produce or resist uh, the dominant uh, causes of, of unsustainability. So seen in this light, advocating for empowerment of women and girls through increased opportunities and participation in the market and or mainstream politics without addressing these fundamental barriers is insufficient to achieving gender equality and without provision of context and site-specific support challenging gendered social norms may be even act actively harmful. And there, so there's a marked consistency in this sort of mainstreaming agenda and pursuing women's empowerment, which is mostly economic empowerment, while also setting targets in other areas, such as commitment to macroeconomic policy, which contributes to increasing financialization, trade liberalization, growing role of transnational corporations, and so forth. So ultimately, through our our analysis anyway, SDG 5, veers towards a sort of apolitical and tokenistic view of gender equality as smart economics, where women are regarded in a solutionist manner as an untapped potential uh, that can act as a source of growth to raise productivity. And this is a, there's a lot of criticisms of this agenda of women's economic empowerment because it's sort of targeting women as under the guise of, of gender equality and sustainable development, is, uh, is to targets them primarily to incorporate them into the market to, to solve the problem of poverty and, and other state goals. And, and this is, in a way, a, a, a kind of example where sort of the, the vocabulary of feminist advocacy is co-opted to support the status quo. And in fact, you can look at the, some of the indicators. The indicator of... of, of, of women's empowerment 
um, in the, the SDGs is to look at the percentage of the number of women in management roles and the number of women in government. I mean, that is the kind of definition. That is, those are the indicators for, for empowerment is having those types of very powerful uh, jobs, um, with, which is a kind of limited view of empowerment, one would say. Um, moving on to the next criticism. Um, there's a problem of accepting the production-reproduction binary. So the second point of contention is that SDG 5 and, and others perpetuates a dichotomy between production and reproduction, which is extensively criticized uh, by ecofeminist political economists um, as perpetuating the devalorization and invisibilization of feminized re reproductive labor. Um, and here we look at the whole agenda architecture as being sort of con conceptually divided into differently valu valued and gendered sectors. So for example, we could ask the question, so why is unpaid domestic work relegated under gender equality only? We don't see any mention of unpaid domestic or care work under any, in any other of the SDGs. It's only under gender equality. It's not under SDG 8, sustainable economic growth. It's not under SDG 16 on the development of inclusive societies. It's not under SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production. So this kind of you know, location of unpaid and domestic work under gender equality rather than these other goals is, you know, other, these other goals, you know, one could say are kind of conventionally more masculine domains, perhaps. Um, just kind of reflects the subordinate status of women's work and reinforces the marginalization of social reproduction as a policy issue. Um, it is assumed to be solely associated with women in the private sphere of the home and not relevant to broader questions of power, politics, or economics. Um, the other thing is that even though, um, say, Target 5.5 5 .5 appeals to recognize and value unpaid care and domestic work, it doesn't go far enough in a feminist perspective to reduce and redistribute um, this care work. So um, it's kind of framing it as a kind of um, a, a private matter uh, rather than a structural matter. And, and this I can re refer to um, feminist economists who have tried to think about how to address care work inequalities and inequalities embedded within the way social reproduction is organized and would say that recognizing and, 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 um, and valuing it is only step one, right? Recognizing and valuing it and, and re-understanding its, its foundational nature to the economies is step one. The rest, in order to transform inequalities that come from, from this um, gendered binary is you need to reduce the amount through collectivization, uh, you need to uh, redistribute it socially, and I'll come on to that in a minute when I talk about the, 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 um, the types of responses and alternative visions that ecofeminists have presented. Um, how am I doing on time, anyway? <laughs> I know that's 10 more minutes? Okay, okay, okay. Um, I suppose there's another kind of critique here. Um, this is this sort of the critique that um, there's a kind of growing emphasis on science, technology, and innovation. So very sort of ecologically, ecological modernization is kind of very prevalent across Agenda 2030. Um, and some would say that the sort of focus on technology, finance, um, trade, all of these things, I mean, they're not, they're not, you know, not relevant to gender, but they're, stereotypically perhaps seen as more masculinist fields um, and some have, some have argued that this kind of you know focus on technology and this kind of relegation of care into a kind of gendered perhaps even ghetto you could say uh, is, is problematic uh, and even the sort of thinking about how gender equality might intersect with notions of a, of a sort of, a sort of um, focus on science, technology, and innovation is to say that the one goal, the one indicator for, for 5B, which is like using technology to enable women, the one indicator for that is percentage of uh, women owning mobile phones. So this is a kind of very limited understanding of how one could use 
tech technological innovation to uh, address social justice concerns. Okay, moving on now to the final section of the talk, which is to think about responses and alternatives. Um, so, the, and this is again, just a kind of a few uh, areas of critique. Um, there are others and they're all, of course, debatable. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions and, and, and objections perhaps to what I've just said. Um, but I'm really trying to reflect um, a movement that is ongoing now um, that, that um, takes these types of theoretical concerns and brings them into the streets and proposes um, a movement for um, feminist climate justice um, that's transformative of the status quo. And this is an approach that's been increasingly being taken by activists uh, around the world um, and this is really to sort of think about a kind of alternative to the policy aims and targets of SDG 5. And I want to just give you some of the main elements of these alternatives. Um, first, um, an eco-feminist outlook requires a, more, requires a more nuanced view of gender, power relations, and social uh, justice than we see in sustainable development goals. And I, as I mentioned earlier, eco-feminist um, thinkers have long embraced this concept of intersectionality um, which is a concept that highlights interactions between gender, race, class, and other categories of difference um, as an approach to analysis of power and knowledge production um, and tries to avoid, you know, reductive and essentialist understandings of gender. Um, so that would be one of the key principles going, going forward as, as an alternative. It needs to take into account a very uh, intersectional understanding of social relations and power relations. In addition, um, an eco-feminist res uh, response to the shortcomings of SDG 5 would also propose a rethinking of some of the very aims of the policy. So what if liberal understandings of empowerment and equality do not actually yield the most desirable outcomes? What if we need to rethink how the concepts of, of equality and empowerment are even used? And here, um, the idea of thinking about empowerment as an end and not a means. So here, again, I'm thinking of, instead of a sort of solutionist approach, which potentially instrumentalizes women for exogenous goals, so, you know, to, to solve a, a market-based problem or to uh, get more women to uh, adopt a certain uh, type of crop or to get more women to, to earn a wage to support, you know, um, uh, families where the state won't, that sort of thing. Um, this is actually seen as an, a, a, a means to a solving a problem, instrumental. Um, but a feminist approach would actually say that, you know, um, ending discrimination and violence against women and girls and improving their socioeconomic political and political status should be a moral imperative in itself, not a lever that does the heavy lifting to achieve more important goals. So I think, so we're definitely trying to think about a feminist understanding of empowerment, and also need to rethink gender equality. So feminists believe that the, the gender equality cannot be achieved without challenging structural domination and the end of, and trying to end oppressions, including imperialism, colonialism, racism, um, which rely on these, these binaries, these hierarchical binaries that devalue women's work and the environment. So women's empowerment and gender inequality cannot be discussed as separate from these, the sort of varied set of social and spatial relations um, and the institutional constraints and biophysical environments within which they, they take place. Um, and this is because um, empowerment and equality are not something that can be imposed from the top down, but instead involves a process of change driven by, by, by women as an inclusive category of themselves. Um, at the same time, we also sort of mention in the chapter that it's important to acknowledge the high risk of backlash in societies where men do not want to create a level playing field by yielding some of their own power to women. And this risk is becoming a reality in ever-growing numbers of states that are passing laws curbing reproductive freedom, banning same-sex relationships, and failing to stop violence against women. And we see news about this. Uh, very recently and uh, spreading in many countries all over the world. So um, it's for these reasons that feminist organization, organizations such as those involved in the women's major group and the women's and gender constituency, constituency should be the ones leading both the empowerment process and the implementation of 
of gender equality goals. And to do so, they need to be, have secu they have to be funded, they have to be supported to be able to operate independently of state and corporate agendas. So, I mean, the, the argument that we tried to make is that, so this notion of liberal equality has its pitfalls, and in fact, a better concept that would be more uh, reflective of this kind of feminist vision is justice, so gender justice goal instead of gender equality goal. Um, I think I only have a couple of more slides, so we're coming nearly to the end. Um, so feminist, more, more on some of the responses, what are some other things? I mean, two things to have, have to do with getting, getting beyond the three pillars of sustainability and getting beyond the greening of capitalism. Um, so, so, yeah, so one of, one of the, 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 the criticisms is that in order to, to move towards transformation, we're going to need to dismantle the binary logic that separates production from reproduction, paid work from unpaid care, and humanity from nature. And insofar as the SDG architecture divides environmental, social, and economic goals into three isolated silos, it perpetuates this fragmented worldview that fails to account for the interdependence and connectedness of activities taking place across the society environment nexus. It also, therefore, obscures path dependencies, trade-offs, and synergies between, um, uh, between involved in pursuing potentially contradictory goals. Okay. I'm just trying to think how to sort shorten some of these notes here. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so basically we're trying, so basically the argument is we're trying to get beyond this three siloed, pillared view of sustainability. And often there's a, there's a critique and there's a longstanding critique that the social pillar of, of a sustainable development has been routinely left out. Um, and, and therefore what has been left out with that is social reproduction and, and, and concerns about, uh, about, about care. So the, 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 the the important sort of feminist critique of the green economy is that it has, has failed to understand the foundational nature of social reproduction, the foundational, uh, the foundational uh, place of the care economy in, and how important that is to developing uh, a sustainable society. So feminists have talked a lot about um, thinking about commoning and thinking about reclaiming common spaces and common uh, common goods that are s fragmented and not addressed uh, sufficiently in the sustainable development vision. So ultimately, it's a much more holistic view of social and ecological reproduction, not as an inferior gendered responsibility, but as a unified process taking place within nature through what Stefania Barca calls the forces of reproduction, the agencies, of the racialized, feminized, waged, and unwaged human and non-human labors that keep the world alive. So in these terms, centering unpaid care work and questions of and questioning feminization and devaluation of social reproduction represents a political and analytical entry point towards developing alternatives to unjust and unsustainable relations. And we can see this in bringing to life brought to life, sorry, in some of the uh, calls uh, that, that have been made recently, um, as recently as COP26 in Glasgow. And these are pictures that, that I took when I was, when I was there uh, last year. And at COP26 last year, the Women's and Gender Constituency of the UNFCCC, which is a major group um, com comprised of over 40 civil society organizations, made it clear that made it clear once again that from its perspective uh, the United Nations continues to fail women on uh, its goals for gender, in gender equality. Um, they made the point that the majority of the delegates and decision makers at the COP were men. The United Nations has not done enough to secure adequate financing for the SDGs. Uh, in fact, only 3% of the climate um, overseas development aid actually targets women's rights and gender inequality. 
um, that the progress made on prioritizing human rights and environmental safeguards has been very slow. And in a closing press release, the Women's and Gender Constituency, which is the largest collective sort of eco-feminist voice in the world, pledged to continue to unapologetically and boldly call for the change we demand, call out false solutions, and to pave the way towards the world we need. And they said, civil society and feminist movements know that there is no choice but to continue pushing for the action and justice that our communities and our world needs. And we will continue to do so together and with fierce care for, for people on the planet. This was also similar rhetoric that I heard at the United Nations Conference on the Status of Women in March a few months ago, where at a, at a session talking about the notion of building back better after COVID with view to United Nations actions that almost on every target and every, um, every indicator, it was far, it was failing. It was, it was a very, very negative uh, report card. So, in response to this, there has been, have been calls for uh, a feminist notion of climate justice, and in fact, a global movement for feminist climate justice is growing. And the elements that I've just discussed a few minutes ago are central to this movement and for the campaigns and policy visions that have emerged from this movement in recent years. And these are, this is a vision that is really not a kind of, you know, feminist version of sustainable development. This is really a kind of, Tra big transformative vision um, for, for, for fundamental system change, right? So not si system change, not climate change, as the, as the slogan goes. So let's just say a few things about the um, feminist Green New Deal. Um, th this is um, developing, it started, it emerged in, in um, the United States in about 2018, 2019, um, from a coalition of organizations um, that were trying to develop this radical vision uh, and a new paradigm, trying to forge active links between climate change, racialized and gender labor exploitation, and so forth, um, and trying to, um, you know, find a kind of, you know, manifesto almost to, to, to bring these to life. And one of the things that I have been involved in myself is a, um, a feminist Green New Deal for the UK uh, and spent uh, a couple of years with a colleague uh, trying to develop a set of recommendations for a feminist Green New Deal from a UK perspective. Um, and I've just put up some of the recommendations uh, on the screen here. You can see, um, hopefully you can see, if I give you a few minutes to read, that they kind of, you know, try to use the language of what I've said comes from theory and the critical perspective to think of some concrete proposals, concrete ways things could be different um, in, in UK society. Um, and, um, and, and this is um, something that is not in the chapter, but it's something that you can actually have a look at online if you want. But I'm gonna stop talking for another two minutes to take a sip of water and let you just think about these, um, these recommendations and perhaps have you have, they have some resonance with you, perhaps you want to ask more about them. Um, I'll just ask you in a minute, so two minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, ha happy to answer questions about this one too when we, when we come to it in a couple of minutes. Um, I should also note that, the, that there are um, feminists in the EU who are also developing a feminist Green New Deal for the EU, and you can have a look at those as well. Um, just to start to wrap up, um, these, what these feminist Green New Deal visions have in common is a rejection of mainstream sustainable develop, development with its desire for gender equality within a capitalist system that retains all of its heteropatriarchal, colonial, and exclusionary features. It's really, as I said, calling for a paradigm shift. And this is an infographic that I've used from the um, Consortium on Gender, Security, and Human Rights, which is another global feminist consortium of activists and academics who have been also trying to articulate and develop uh, this kind of radical call for transformational change. Um, and they make the point in this infographic, and I highly recommend going to this website and looking at some of their other infographics and how they make the case. But they're saying, you know, that. There's lots of different versions of Green New Deals out there, but they're not all the same. And that a feminist Green New Deal has something unique, which is that it tries to understand humans as part of nature, not its master. It's thinking about how we can live in responsible and reciprocal relationships with other human beings. They need to focus less on shiny techno fixes and more on restoring ecosystems, learning from the expertise of rural communities, indigenous communities who live long, lived in balance with the rest of the natural world. So it really is also not just a policy paradigm shift, but an epistemological paradigm shift as well. We need to change the way we think as well as what we do. In the aftermath of the COVID-19 pa pandemic, activists, academics, and decision makers around the world have been devising strategies for gender and climate just, uh, for a gender and climate just post-pandemic recovery. The overlapping crises of COVID care and climate have engendered new vulnerabilities whilst, whilst exacerbating old ones and further foreground the need to challenge dominant development models and their constitutive, in, constitutive injustices in favor of a more radical intersectional politics that, that value socio-ecological reproduction instead of prioritizing profit and growth at the expense of care and the environment. This historical moment presents not only an opportunity for the United Nation and governments to think of ways of building back better, but also re reinforces the urgency and the need for deep-rooted transformation that critical ecofeminists have championed for decades. This transformation is necessary not only to reclaim the failed promises of the SDGs and to recover from the pandemic, but also to dismantle the oppressions caused by centuries of racial and patriarchal capitalism. Finally, the past decade since, writing, since the writing and adoption of the SDGs has seen a, re a renaissance in critical ecofeminist thinking about mainstream and alternative programs for us alternative future. Once dismissed as utopian at best, irrational fluff at worst, ecofeminist ideas about political economy, democracy, and justice now inform exciting new visions for the kind of future we want. With a record number of young women and gender non-binary activists participating actively in the global movement for climate justice. These connections between gender politics and sustainable development have never been so radical or so visible or so inclusive. And this is a, a, um, a screenshot from Twitter from um, an, a Nigerian um, climate activist, uh, Adenike Olosadu, who calls herself the ecofeminist, who's discovered ecofeminism uh, 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 through her climate justice activism. And seeing this new generation of climate activists, particularly in countries of the global south, is actually a very positive way to end the talk. Um, and so we kind of end with saying that it, it looks like, if you look at the activists, you look at what's happening in the street, we may have been, feminists may have been climbing out of this polluted stream to chart a new course down a different river to a gender and climate just future where gender norms are radically transformed, where care work is seen as a collective public good, and where the domination of a minuscule minority over the majority of the planet's humans and other species is no longer tolerated. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much for this very insightful presentation. Um, also, as a student of the Otto Suhr Institute myself, I always experience that there is a lot of resonance when it comes to structural and gender-related inequalities. So um, I'm also very excited uh, to hear some questions. Um, so if you want to pose a question, you can just put your hand up and we will um, give you the microphone. We're going to try and answer them together and Ursula is going to also take the lead. Okay. We can talk through that, can yeah. we? Can we? Okay. Can so you if that works, then we don't need a second one. That's yeah, it sounds like one. Um. Yeah, all right, okay. Thank you, Sharon, for the <laughs> wonderful talk. I'm, I was so inspired listening to it as well. I hope you liked it as well. Um, any questions? Who, does, who wants to open the floor? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. I have a question um, about this part where you talked about women being generally, uh, you know, um, having more consequences from climate change and that um, I, we, we, you also talked about that in the chapter that there's also the danger of at the same time there being kind of an essentialization that, you know, women are just closer to nature and that, that because of that they have to be integrated into the policies. And I'm just wondering, like, how can we at the same time acknowledge this fact without tapping into this essentialism and how's that working in the SDGs? Um, I think that's an absolutely wonderful question. Uh, the first thing that I would say is to acknowledge that there is material and empirical basis to a lot of these associations and a lot of these tropes that we criticize that uh, have um, that can be essentialist if they draw these kind of high profile theoretical abstractions. But if we actually take a critical approach to looking at these complex networks of social relations, how they have historically evolved as a result of you know, interactions between and synergies between social processes and keep our head on you know, what's ac the actually existing patriarchal and racial capitalism and try not to um, universalize the experiences of any one specific spatial or temporal context and look at the kind of variegation and divergence of all these different communities, all these places that are engaged and influenced by these global systems but are always positioned in them in, in a unique way. I feel like that is the most effective way to counter any essentialization of gender identity or class identity or ethnic identity or any sort of uh, process like that. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, another, another um, way of thinking about this is uh, certainly uh, another um, PhD researcher that I've worked with um, has did a whole study of the UNF C process and the women's gender constituency within mm -hmm. it and talks about a, a movement from, from, the, from the UN being sort of gender blind. So the, UN, the whole sort of you know, UNF C framework was gender blind and over however many years of feminist activism is now they're in a, gender is in it, there's a gender action plan, but, it's, but, they're, but feminists are in a gender bind mm -hmm. in that they want to put gender in the, in the document, but in doing so, it risks this kind of, as you say, this sort of, you know, women are some, some, somehow special, they're different, they need special attention, they're either victims of this, prob this problem or they are gonna solve it because they are somehow more knowledgeable and closer to nature. So it's this bind that you sort of get, get kind of trapped in. It's almost like a discursive trap whenever you sort of try to advocate for women or gender in these processes, because it's so simplifying. Mm -hmm. And I find uh, one really interesting way of looking, uh, talking about this historically has been a work of Mary, Mer Mary Miller, who specifically looked at these different strands of argumentation against you know, connections between experiences and treatment of women as a group and the environment historically, and how you, know, different, diff you can take a multiplicity of different theoretical approaches, whether you think those shared processes of, or, or positions within logic of domination are due to some you know, internal lesson, due to some spiritual affinity, et cetera, those kinds of arguments some have been made in the past, or whether you look at it from, for example, from a political economy perspective as a series of historical and material processes and path dependencies and appre appreciate um, the situatedness of those processes. Answered your question. Hopefully. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, do we have more questions? Hello, and, th Hello <laughs> and thank you for, for your uh, input. Um, I was wondering, um, so this field of, uh, of environmental, of global environmental governance uh, has a certain stance on, on gender issues uh, that you described very well and gave a, a very, um, very uh, relevant critique of. Um, I was wondering in other global governance fields, um, like um, whatever there is, uh, peace, security, trade, uh, do you know how the field of, of uh, environmental governance compares to these other governance <laughs> fields uh, in terms of uh, progressiveness of gender issues? And is there anywhere to look at um, which would be more progressive or whether there would be any uh, room for improvement. Oh, there is always a lot of room for improvement, but uh, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, you're trying to think, of, is, is, it, is it unique to sustainable development and this, these kinds of um, problems? Probably not. Um, certainly the, the Commission on the Status of Women conference um, was covering all different issues, all different sectors, all different kinds of areas of, of UN um, processes and UN policy. And it's overwhelmingly critical of, you know, in population and in, in trade and, mm -hmm. um, you know, most World Health Organization. I mean, there's this, I guess, you know, you could say it's a sort of, it's a kind of feature of the scale of, of global politics that it, it perhaps is, is always going to be um, reduce, reducing things to kind of co basic common denominators or simplifying to, in order to find agreement. Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to get agreement among mem member states over issues of reproductive freedom, for example, mm -hmm. or reproductive health has been always a very difficult uh, <laughs> endeavor indeed. Um, so I think that you'll find the same kind of struggles in most other fields, but in the, you'll also find the same amount of feminist outside lobbying trying to shape and to at least get some recognition, mm -hmm. even tiny ones, um, inside. So I think in, in a sense, you know, for, for us as academics to criticize is, is not necessarily to say that the feminists have failed in their attempt to lobby and to, to criticize them and say they're doing it wrong. We all, but we think that there's still a role for standing outside and, pr and problematizing, questioning, identifying the, the, you know, the politics behind the discourse, policy, politics behind the policy. So I'm not really answering your question, but I think that I, you know, I don't think we can look for any, any best practice no. <laughs> to, to look to, to counteract this discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for example, UN, uh, UNFCCC and a lot of the documents under the gender mandate describe gender and to an extent these days, other axes of oppression as cross-cutting issues, right? So across a wide variety of policy agendas. And lots of these things that we've been discussing today are not, have never been just within environmental governance, right? We're talking about sustainable development. So development discourse, de development economics, so, and furthermore, if we start to think about development as a discourse of power, right, it is something that touches and aims to include within its remit all, almost all aspects of global political life, right, from security to reproduction to different areas of social policy. So I would say there's a um, lot of overlap between these feminist discussions of these topics in many different governance fields. Hmm. Perfect. Um, so, who wants to go next? So, thank you very much for your lecture again. Um, so, from what I understood, you or ecofeminist theories like criticizing the, the problematic assumptions in the SDG that is made about interconnections between gender and environmental destruction and climate change and just the way that the whole SDG on gender equality is embedded into a rather neoliberal thinking. Um, while I find that quite interesting and 
I guess, <laughs> highly agree. Um, also reading the feminist Green New Deal that you showed in the end from the UK, I was wondering how you can actually bridge the gap between promoting um, those, well, highly needed deep system changes and also producing at the same time ad hoc improvements for especially women in the global south whose reality or political conditions um, are that of imminent inequality and high vulnerability to environmental de um, deterioration. Um, or as you said, women who are suffering from anti-feminist legislation, um, yeah, or maybe put in other words, like how can you reconcile that maybe also rather theoretical background, um, you said rather a questioning stance instead of a problem solving one, um, and the need for immediate concrete action to, yeah, improve women's life, thank you. <laughs> That's the classic. We were talking about that earlier, right, in, in our discussion about this notion of needing practical, meeting practical immediate needs mm -hmm. Uh, to improve women's lives now versus the strategic feminist project of social transformation, political transformation. And this has been, you know, the discussion for the whole history of feminism, right? You know, how do you liberate women from terrible situations in their, in their households and give them money or give them, you know, an income, mm -hmm. give them independence, but still within a kind of very oppressive state or, or community? Mm -hmm. And those obviously, yes, have to happen um, at the same time that we're pressing for a big thing. I guess um, I would say that, that um, one, artic one kind of approach that you might want to look at is, is it's kind of unfolding as we speak. It's called the Action Nexus. And women's, the Women's Environment and Development Organization, which is based in New York, but it's a global feminist organization, has un undertaken this transversal global project of trying to come up with a, what they call a um, a feminist decolonial global Green New Deal. And it's, it's basically trying to argue that economic justice and climate justice have to be pursued together. And so it's, it doesn't want to just talk about climate justice without talking about economic justice and mm -hmm. how institutions like the United Nations and other big global you know, institutions can take a lead role in, 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 in driving economic change and economic justice, so redistributing wealth, making sure that, that debts are repaid, debts are, are forgiven, uh, that, that instead of sort of doing this kind of, um, kind of almost disaster capitalism, that help, helping people in the global south is a good business for, mm. for, for companies in the global north, in fact, that there needs to be re global wealth redistribution so that more funds go to the local level and that people can decide how they're going to meet their needs themselves. And that includes people of all genders can, can decide how they can meet their needs uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term, immediate term. So, and that's a kind of argument that that will lead to transformation maybe faster than some of, some of the more abstract you know, arguments of, of feminist theorists, right? Mm -hmm. That this is about economic justice and seeing what happens from there. So the argument is thinking about the climate finance, thinking about debt, debt uh, pol uh, tax policy, debt policy, all sorts of things. If you have a look on their website, Women's Environment and Development Organization, you'll find a few really good downloadable documents that talk about this, mm -hmm. this vision uh, that I highly recommend. And I, I would say that is one of the kind of deepest contradictions within both uh, SDG 5 and the framework more at large, that while we see the kind of historical incorporation of some feminist language and some feminist demands, it is in total opposition to the macroeconomic policy that the UN development and uh, um, policy at large and specifically SDGs are committed to that have through a year, throughout the years again and again been demonstrated to be directly detrimental to any achievement of gender, uh, gender or other forms of justice. And uh, that is one of the criticisms that be became so prevalent at the last COP and otherwise that specifically the money, the funding hasn't been there, the commitment to actually back, back up this deep redistributive change has not even began to happen. <laughs> 
Okay, do we have more questions? Yes, Estefania. Uh, many thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering now um, if you can elaborate further about how can the international institutions uh, include the demands of the uh, women activists, mostly from the global south and in the dynamics of the, the institutions are mostly governed by men in the global north. Uh, yeah, the demandings uh, about the SDG 5. Thank you. So how can, how can it become more inclusive? I'm not sure I, I fully heard you <laughs> your question. Yeah, how can, like how the demandings of the activist woman can, can be heard or can be uh, materialized by the institutional, the institutions in the global north when like if we have these dynamics between the global north and the global south and mostly uh, the, as you said in the presentation, the, the women are affected and in the global south by uh, the destruction of the climate change and, and how can they be heard by the institutions? I mean, one, one answer I would give is that, again, coming back to this, again, from outside the system, right, the lobbying, the ad, ad, advocacy and activism at a global scale, that this is, at, you know, the last few years that I've been attending a lot of their Zoom meetings to discuss this, this big global vision, is that they make a deliberate att uh, effort to decenter voices from the global north and center uh, and amplify feminist activists from the global south. So every meeting, every discussion is is always led by 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 a speaker from the from the global south. And they practice exactly what they preach, which is about decolonizing and decentering the privileged voices of the global north. Now this is they they're 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 modeling this in their own process whether that has any effect on the, the institutions, um, maybe it will. I mean, you will see that the, the, the language of intersectionality, which is kind of like comes from feminist, you know, legal theory and, and then moves into movements, has now been kind of adopted in some quarters of the United Nations or the, the European Union. So perhaps by using it, making it kind of normal, normalizing the use of it, perhaps. So again, by making this kind of political commitment to changing who speaks, it may make a difference, but I don't know, we have to wait and see. I mean, do you have an answer to that? Because I've, I, it's nice to hear people, and so you don't have to all just ask questions, just reflections, opinions, mm -hmm. things that you think also need to be considered that we didn't mention, that we left out? I mean, you know. Uh, no, no, like, uh, I, I get what you said, like, uh, um, well, it's more like the, this dichotomy, like, uh, for example, when we were thinking about the activists um, of climate justice, uh, in my mind, there is a lot of women, there is a lot of women in the global south, and and yeah, the, deba the academic debate, sometimes it gets uh, far away from the real situation sometimes, and it's difficult to mix both of them uh, sometimes, but I guess that uh, as, you, as you show us with the Twitter uh, screenshot, uh, like um, with social media and with other tools uh, are more getting together and are the voices getting amplified, so. Yeah, actually that article, let me just see if I can bring Bring that slide back up. Um, that article, that's actually, she's tweeting, Adenike is tweeting an article called The Faces of Ecofeminism, mm -hmm. Promoting Women Promoting Gender Equality Climate Justice Worldwide. If you look for that article, just Google it. Uh, I can't remember the name of the, of the author, but they, it, it profiles, you know, the fact that so many women in the global south are now engaging with these uh, and actually using the concept of ecofeminism. So, which is a big change from in the last sort of maybe five years. Okay, I think looking at the time, I would suggest to take maximum two last questions. Um, 
Yeah. Do we uh, have any more hands? This one. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Hello. Ah. Thanks for the interesting lecture again. I'm interested in uh, you discussing the topic of reproductive work and uh, domestic care work, mm -hmm. um, where you more than once talked about redistributing and uh, reducing domestic care work um, yeah. or reproductive work. And also like in the same f line of thought, I think you uh, mentioned kind of defeminizing reproductive mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. and um, seeing how reproductive work is set up and um, like how reproduction in like a literal sense works. I'm um, curious to know what you mean by reducing it especially and also what you mean by redistributing it and how much commodification has to go into redistributing mm -hmm. reproductive work. Okay, sure, good question. Um, and actually, if you also want, uh, here I am t giving you more mm -hmm. reading to do, but um, I've just finished um, um, writing a report for Oxfam on the, on the issue of um, re um, addressing the impacts of climate change on mm -hmm. care work in the Global South, particularly. And we talk about this 5R framework that I mentioned that feminist economists have, have, have come up with, which is re recognize, uh, reduce, redistribute, um, revalue, re uh, reward, and recognize. No, represent, sorry. So there's five R's, anyway. But you, you've asked about two R's, the, the re reduce and, and redistribute. So those are to do primarily with, at the, on the on the most obvious level, about socializing uh, reproductive, social reproduction, right? So back to like the welfare state, right? Re, re bringing back so social infrastructure that enables people's needs for, for care to be collectivized and made a, 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 a social uh, uh, endeavor rather than a private one. So, and so it's no longer assuming that this work is done unpaid in the private domestic service. Not to say that this would never happen, but to provide an infrastructure of social services, um, you know, type, the types of, of sectors that have been certainly in countries like the UK and others that have been sort of dismantled over years of neoliberalism to rebuild this, these means of collectivizing and socializing and commoning social reproduction. Um, investing in hospitals, daycare centers, etc. That's a way of ensuring that the ind burden of individuals is reduced, right? So almost like economies of scale. In, 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 in a sense that that is a, a, another way to reduce the, the sort of burdens of individualized social reproduction is through appropriate te technological, labor saving, saving technologies. Mm -hmm. So particularly in the global south, there's an argument for a, a types of um, so, uh, community water pumps, community cook, uh, cooking stations, um, making sure that the individual work of having to collect water for the family, you know, build your type of cooker that you use is reduced because it's shared, if that makes sense. Redistribution is similar in that it's again redistributed from the individual to uh, people, to those who have not done it, so at the level of the household, to this is around culture sh culture change mm -hmm. to make care the type of activity that is for all genders and not feminized, right? So redistributing it, and there's a lot of programs that Oxfam has tried to develop so when they go into communities to try and talk about, um, you know, how they're adapting to climate change, that they think about how they can promote. Uh, environmental care and, and, and child care and so forth between within the family and start to, to challenge gender roles so that, that men and boys are actively encouraged to take to learn about and take on and to see as valuable that that type of work that they will have seen as not for them if you see what I mean so that's a culture shift in redistribution but you can support that through policies like parent, paid parental care. Mm -hmm. You can uh, support it through pay, you know, paying people to, to you know, do the valuable work of care and not seeing it as you know, something they have to 
make a sacrifice in order to, to, to do it. Does, does that answer your question, Ish? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I think we would have time for one last question um, before we close. Um, yeah, one very quick question. One very quick <laughs> because question. Because the live stream is stopping in three minutes and quick answer then. Yeah. yeah. Do we have a last quick question? Otherwise, okay. Yeah. So I try to be fast. Also, again, many thanks for the lecture. Um, despite being a critical approach and not a problem solving, I do see also from the discussion that it does target international institutions. And I was wondering how does it um, translate then to the national level. So we see many states adopting um, a foreign feminist, a femin <laughs> feminist foreign policy. Would we then need an eco-feminist foreign policy? And how can we like combine issues of women, peace and security with a eco-feminist approach? Thanks. That's, you have well, one minute to answer this complex <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to, but I think this is excellent because I've seen lots of stuff on feminist foreign policy. I've mm -hmm. seen lots of stuff on like global feminist climate justice. Mm -hmm. and, and they, of course, they go together. But I don't know if that conversation is being had. Yeah. Uh, but they should. Although historically, lots of eco-feminist activism was also, you know, anti-nuclear, anti-militarist, anti-extractivist, and all those things are, you know, very intimately connected, as we know, within foreign policy. So I do think that would be a very interesting conversation to bring to write this specific historical moment. So thank you for that question. And around uh, climate finance, which I think we've already mentioned, that's yeah. a key um, foreign policy issue as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So, so the conversation goes on, but the live stream stops in uh, about one minute. And um, yeah, I still would like to thank you so much. Um, uh, it was mentioned um, the lecture series is related to a book, an edited volume, and you contribute uh, a chapter. And some of the students and me, we discussed the chapter and also the different lectures. And what we appreciate most besides all criticism is that like, in your case, you can also come up with suggestions how to change things. Um, and yeah, so we really appreciate this um, respo your responses and alternatives to the current system. But also, as we learned in the discussion, we also have to arrange somehow with the system <laughs> for immediate, more immediate action. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that you came to Berlin. Yeah, thanks a lot.